Hello, everyone. I am Catalina Gomez. I'm a reference librarian and a curator at the Library of Congress Hispanic Division. And it's a great pleasure to have you all here today for the next presentation uh, and for me to introduce our next author, Pablo Cartaya. Uh, just before I introduce the author, I'd like to let you all know that he will be signing uh, his book uh, from 5.30 to 6.30. It's kind of close to this stage. Um, but yeah, from 5.30 to 6.30, he'll be signing his books. Pablo Cartaya is an award-winning author, speaker, actor, and educator. He is the author of the critically acclaimed middle grade novels, The Epic Fail of Arturo Zamora, which is a 2018 Pura del Pre honor book, and Marcus Vega Doesn't Speak Spanish. His new novel, which is the one that he is reading from today and signing from, uh, is uh, Each Tiny Spark, and he'll be reading uh, some excerpts uh, for you um, uh, shortly. Uh, it was published by the new Coquila Penguin Random House imprint, uh, which is an imprint that focuses on publishing diverse books for children and young, adult, young adults. Uh, Cartaya's work has been reviewed by the New York Times and also been featured in the Washington Post. Uh, he is also an actor. Uh, he has acted on stage and television, uh, and he uh, co-starred on uh, Will and Grace. Do you all know uh, that show? <laughs> Uh, and he also gives talks frequently uh, around the country about uh, reading, writing, and multilingualism. Please join me in welcoming Pablo Cartaya. Thank you so much. The parts of this old car will take time to find, but we know what we need at least. We have the puzzle mapped out on paper and the instructions on how to reassemble it. I wish I had a blueprint for my papi. I don't know the pieces he's keeping inside. How can I help him put anything back together if he doesn't share the pieces? Papi? My voice wobbles. Hmm? He's focused on the car. But, but why? Why what, Chispita? Why didn't you ever respond to the videos I sent you? Papi stops what he's doing and stares at the ground. He exhales loudly and turns to me slowly. You know, I'm trying my best, Emilia. He lowers his head. That's all I can do for you right now. Bobby puts his hammer down and walks off, leaving me with the shell of an old car and a welder that's still on. I have a memory for things that matter to me. I'm not giving up on my dad, not by a long shot. But he's going to have to talk to me, and even if it makes him uncomfortable, actually, Everyone needs to start doing that around here. Buenas tardes! So that was a section from uh, Each Tiny Spark, which just came out on August 6th. And I was reading a section about the, the dad and his daughter, Emilia, who is narrating the book. But first, let's start again, please. Can we say buenas tardes? Buenas tardes. Okay, nosotros vamos a hablar español también aquí. ¿Se parece? Is we good? We're going to speak a little Spanish in here today. All right? As well. Now, the thing is, a lot of my books, a lot of my books focus on three main things, three main components, family, culture, and community. And abuelos, and abuelas. Who knows what an abuela is? A grandma. An abuela is a grandma. Right? And also... Speaking of family, this book is very personal to me. It's very personal to me because the main character, Amelia, is modeled after my own daughter, my own daughter, Penelope. She's going to be so embarrassed when she hears that I called her Penelope because she says, Papi, I told you, call me Penny. <laughs> but I named, we named her Penelope, so I'm just going to say Penelope. Anyway, so Penelope is a really special kid. Um, and when I was writing this book, she's a preteen. She's 12 and a half years old right now, my daughter. The character in this book is 12 and a half years old. And you know when you say that writers write what they know, writers write what they experience. Well, I am experiencing as a father, a 12 and a half year old preteen going through it. Okay? So I'll give you an example. So the other day, you know, my daughter, my daughter has this thing where she likes to use our shower to take a shower. 
right? So she'll go right into our bedroom, go right into the shower and start using the shower. But sometimes she doesn't announce it. She doesn't say, I'm going to go use the shower, Papi, you know, I'm shut the door. No, she just walks right in. So when I go in to go brush my teeth, I hear, Papi, stop it, stop it, get out, get out. I'm showering. And I just like run out. She comes out of the shower wearing my wife's bathrobe like this. Looking at me, and she's like, don't be weird. It just walks off. <laughs> Bedtime, she goes, she lays down. It's all quiet for a minute. Well, are you going to snuggle me good night? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I run in, I go into bed. I lie into the bed with her. I put my arm around. She goes, don't, don't, don't touch me. <laughs> don't be weird. She throws her leg on me. She nuzzles into me, my little girl. <laughs> Don't be weird. But this is what it is, right? She's going through this thing, and I find this age so fascinating. I find the way that she's navigating the world to be fascinating. She is equally still a little kid and also trying to find her own voice. And when I was writing this book, this is what I was trying to understand. This is what I was trying to listen to. As a writer, we spend a lot of time listening, listening to the world around us. And I spent a lot of time listening to my daughter. My daughter is neurodiverse. She has ADHD. And I love the way her mind works. And so when I was thinking about this character, Emilia, who also has ADHD, I thought about things. I was thinking about, like, what is what is a, a typical day with my own kid? What does that look like? Yeah, yeah, I say, swinging my feet and munching on toast and talking about the week ahead. She likes to go over my agenda for the week, but it's kind of annoying because sometimes that's all she talks about. So you got it, Mom asks. Huh? Your stuff for the week, sweetheart, she says. Math test Thursday. You have vocabulary test Friday. What do you have for social studies? Oh, Clarissa's party. I can go, right? Emilia, mom says, using my name like a sharp-edged sword to make her point. I need to be able to go on this trip knowing you're ready for the week. Yes, mom, you've told me like a million times. And social studies? What about it? What do you have for Mr. Rick's class this week? I don't know, something, maybe a test. Maybe, do I have to call? No, mommy, please, can we just talk about something else? She lets out a sigh. Okay, mi amor, what do you want to talk about? This is literally text by text, a conversation I had with my own daughter. I put it into the book. You know what I told her? I said, listen, you got to be careful what you say to me because I'll just maybe put it in the book. <laughs> All right? And it's just the way she's trying to assert her independence. And I love that. She's at that midway point between becoming a young adult and still holding on to that adolescence. And it's a beautiful age, and I wanted to represent that in the best way possible. When she read the book, she looked, she looked at me, and she goes, it's pretty good. <laughs> the best compliment a 12 and a half year old can tell you. Pretty good. It's very excited. So I said about abuelas. I love my abuela. Who here has their abuela still around? A few of you, okay. So I loved, I loved my grandparents. I loved my abuela especially. And you know, abuelas, all right, so I'm Cuban. I'm Cuban-American, and in my culture, in my culture, the Cuban-American is like, well, we have the abuela character has kind of different levels, right? You have the really sweet abuela that does, that kind of supersedes whatever mom says, right? And so she has like her grandson or her grandchild, and that's like whatever the grandson or grandchild wants, abuela gets. And it frustrates mom, right? But if you're the kid, if you're the grandkid, you love that, right? I remember being a little kid, and I would walk home, and I'd be all excited, and you know, my abuela would be in the kitchen, she'd go, mi amor, and she'd do that little like peach, you know, the cheek pinch, and I'd come in, and she'd make me un batido de mango, who knows what a batido de mango is? Mango milkshake, she'd go and she'd make me a mango milkshake, and my mom would come rushing in. No, 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 Pablo's not supposed to have sugar. And my abuela would go like this, 
and put ice cream and sugar and sugar and milk and mango and I nina and just go like that and pour me the mango and I'd be in the middle and I'd be like this looking at abuela gracias abuela and I look at my mom that's an abuela the abuela the also the other kind of the abuela is is the judgy one the judgy abuela the one that like you bring home somebody and she just like grills her bueno just walks off there's that abuela the super judgy abuela there's the other there's the other abuela it's quiet. It's reserved. Sometimes she's strict. Sometimes she drops out the chancla. Who knows what the chancla is? Raise your hand if you have been victimized by the chancla in your life. I have. It's usually when I use the Lord's name in vain. When I say, Jesus Christ, abuela, oye me lo que la huella de sida ahora mismo. Pulls out the sandals, starts chasing me. Abuela, I'm sorry. But that abuela, the quiet one, the one that's reserved, the one that we don't always understand what she's going through, that also is a character of the abuela. And that character specifically was one that made her way into this book. She's quiet, she's tough. And you learn later on why she had to be tough. So this is all fun. There's a lot of personal things in this book, but I would be remiss if I didn't write a book with Latinx characters in this country, I would be remiss if I did not talk about the immigration problem that we have in this country. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the types of inequities that exist in communities between brown and black people and white people. I'm gonna tell you a story. When I was researching this book, this book is set in Northern Georgia. It's a fictional town, but when I was doing research, when I was doing research for this book, I went and I visited a town in northern Georgia. When I got there, it's this typical, idyllic, you know, sweet southern town. You know, there's a main street. There's a main street there, and they have these cute shops. And they had a butcher shop, and I love meat. I love to cook, so I went into this butcher shop, and I come outside. And I see the, you know, the barber shops that have those little swirly things. Like I live in, I, I've lived in cities my whole life, so that to me is like, oh my God, that's the coolest thing ever. So these little swirly things, right? So I go and I take a picture of it. I come back inside. This lady comes out of her truck and runs in. She says, boy, what are you taking pictures of? Excuse me? What are you taking pictures of? I said, just the barber shop sign, man. That's it. I didn't really quite get you know what her thing was so I get out of the shop we go to get gas and I go to get gas and I cross over the tracks the train tracks as the trains run through there through the town I cross right over the train tracks and across the street I see grocery store Latino and I see a sign that says carniceria who knows what carniceria is butcher shop right a butcher shop and I see Carniceria across the street, and I see a Vietnamese nail salon, and then I see right next to the gas station, I see an auto shop, an auto and body repair shop that is touching the tracks. And I notice one thing. The track is literally dividing two cultures. The track in the town is literally dividing two cultures. I can see from this, from this auto shop just beyond there, I see Main Street, and I see the butcher shop. The cute, the cute bandstand. And I turn over here, and I see Carniceria, and I see the Vietnamese nail salon, and I see the streets, and I see the people that are coming in and out of those shops, and I see the train track, and it's splitting it right in half. And when I was writing this book, that's where I decided I'm going to set this book in that auto shop right in between those two places, right on that train track. You know how when they say, oh, you're from the wrong side of the tracks? What side is that? What side is that? And so this character, much like my own daughter, much like my own family, this character, she comes to understand something deeper about her community. She comes to understand that her community is not just bandstands and parades. 
there is a history in her community that is problematic. A history of anti-immigrant sentiment. Do you know, do you know that in the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, do you know who saved the building of the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta? Do you know who? Mexican immigrants. They brought thousands, thousands of Mexican workers to Georgia to help build and finish the stadiums in the 1996 Olympics. They built, they literally built the Olympics. Do you know in 2012 the laws that they passed? Georgia right now has one of the strictest immigration policies in the country. It is also, ironically, one of the most diverse states in the country. How does that make sense? How does that make sense? And Amelia starts to realize that. Her town is called Maryville. Maryville, and then on the other side of the tracks, it's called Park View. And Abuela shops at the grocery store Latino across the tracks. Her best friend, Gustavo, lives in Park View across the tracks. Emilia goes to school in Maryville. I love Maryville and Park View. I love the way the trees surround us on all sides, the way the train tracks cut through town, the way people get too excited about fireworks or a school football game or a random festival. There is good in this town. But you can't put together a vehicle with a messed up bead line. You can't expect your car to drive normally with a dangled, damaged axle. You have to take it apart. You have to examine the pieces that are warped or corroded or missing. You have to grind out the corrosion. You must take a dead blow hammer and smash the warped parts into place. When I write my stories, Yo uso mucho español. I write about my culture. I write about my family. I write about my community. I write mostly because I spent a lot of my life trying to relearn my Spanish after it was erased from me in my classrooms. I had to relearn parts of my culture that I was too often told I didn't look enough of this. I was an actor, as was mentioned. I'm going to tell you a story about me acting. So I did all right. I was, you know, Will and Grace and, and all that. And I had a casting director tell me, I don't know why your name is Pablo. And I said, that's my name. He says, well, you don't look like a Mexican. You should change your name. I said, I changed my name. I, I'm, I'm not even Mexican. I'm Cuban-American. You don't look like a Cuban either. You should change your name to blend. And this is a story that goes on and on and on. And we are constantly told, as people of color, we are constantly told, don't be this, be more of this. Assimilate more of this. Blend in. Right? My books do not blend. And they don't apologize for the Spanish that they speak. So, oh, I got riled up. I was like, all right, let's go. Where's Donald Trump? Come on, man, let's go. No, all right, let's go. Uh, he's going to come. I'm going to get Secret Service tackling me on the floor right now. Um, all right, so we have a few minutes. So I could take, uh, take a couple of questions because, you know, and I, I do want to say very briefly, to all the yellow T-shirts, Today in the library, in the festival, I want to thank you all so much, you know, for all your work and all your help, uh, truly. And to the Library of Congress and the National Book Festival, this is my first, this is my first National Book Festival. I hope it's not my last because I love it. All right, so yeah, so we can take a few questions. I'll do my best as quickly to answer as many as possible before we, before we run out of time. All right, don't everybody just run up at once, all right? Let's slow down. Let's keep this orderly. All right, so I'll tell you another Abuela story. All right, before, we do, before we're done. So, oh, somebody has a question. 
Where? Yes. Hey. That's a great question. So what is your name, dear? Andrea. Andrea. So Andrea just asked a question. Her dad is Mexican. Her mother is white. She grew up not learning Spanish, not knowing Spanish. And do I teach my kids Spanish? I wish I taught them more. I wish I taught them more. Um, the interesting thing is culturally, they are very connected. My daughter, Penelope, she identifies as a person of color. She's like, I am Latina. And she's like, I am Latina. And she's like, she, she, does, she does, you know the thing that the, the, the kids, that, I am Latina, you know, like that, you know? So she has that, but the Spanish, the language isn't quite there yet, and she gets frustrated by it, you know? My son, my eight-year-old, he's like, croquetas all day, every day. Croqueta, cafe con leche, pan con leche, like every, anything. He's like, whatever. He's like, no, this is because I'm, I'm Cuban. I like this food. All right. So there's, there's different access points to our culture. Sometimes, you know how like when you eat a piece of food that reminds you of home, or reminds you of your, of your family's home, like it, it instantly makes you feel connected to that culture? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I love food. I write with a lot of food in there because of that. Um, it's almost like a supplement to the Spanish, you know? Um, but there's, men, there's a lot of different access points to the way that we get our culture. And there isn't a straight line. This is not a monolithic experience. We, every single one of us has our own stories and our own backgrounds, our own histories that we get to claim, right? And the idea of somebody silencing our stories is whack. Y ya no mas. And that's it. You know? That's it. Anybody else? Una pregunta. Por Una pregunta más. Sí, señora. <laughs> um, soy pura gringa, pero hablo español. Qué bueno. Qué aceito um, tan bueno. I, I'm... Uh... I'm, I speak Spanish, but I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm white. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm, <laughs> I'm writing a novel in which the, the characters are mostly white, but there is some Spanish in it. And I've spent a couple of months trying to investigate how I should handle the Spanish that's spoken by Americans in there. And actually, I'm a, an, I'm a new fan. You were suggested as somebody to read to oh. find out how to do this. I hope I don't disappoint you. No, no, no. I, I've already, this, this is your third book I've bought. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> but, um, My kids thank you, too. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, how do I write it in the book? You're the only person that I've read who actually treats English and Spanish equally right within the dialogue. It doesn't look any different. Yeah. Everybody else puts it in italics or somehow says something. How should I, as a non-native speaker, handle that um, without so, being um, offensive? Because yes. that's what's been suggested. OK, so in the interest of time, tell it true. Tell it true, right? Don't make it about, I'm writing a book that has Spanish in it. Why are the characters living in this world speaking Spanish in the first place? And tell it true. Right? That's all we can do, right? In this crazy world that we're in right now, where so much dis disinformation is being thrown around, the only thing, our goal, our task, not only as writers but as humans, is to tell it true, right? And so that's, all I, that's as much as I can tell you just in a quick answer. If you want, tweet out to me, and I'll try to expand on that idea. But... You know, we are in an age where that is hard. It's hard to break apart what is real, what is not real, right? The only thing that we can do as individuals is tell it real like we see it and call BS when it's done, when somebody says something that is false. Call BS on it. I'm not going to say the actual word because there's children present, <laughs> but in my mind, I'm thinking that word, you know? And that is what it is. I always finish my my talks, and especially because I talk to a lot of young people around the country, and I, I always tell them that it took me a long time to feel like I could claim my voice and say that my voice matters, and I tell them, now you tell me your voice matters because I'm telling you your voices do, your stories matter, your lives and your histories and your cultures matter. So look, we're here, National Book Festival. 
I want everybody on the count of three to say, my voice matters, and hold yourself right here, right? And hold your stories dear to you and set them out to the world. One, two, three. My voice matters. No, come on. One, two, three. My voice matters. Thank you all very much.